I'm John Banther, and this is Classical Breakdown. From WETA Classical in Washington, we're your guide to classical music. In this episode, I'm joined by WETA Classical's Evan Keeley, and we're going on a journey through time with The Fantasy, an elusive type of work that's also defined by what it isn't. From composers and works you've never heard of to the defining works of the genre, we're off to discover how the fantasy captured our hearts, ears, and imaginations for centuries. Plus, stay with us to the end as we read your reviews from Apple Podcasts. I think we are set up for a fun journey with a fantasy, Evan. So many of the forms in classical music developed with a lot of music theory, a lot of technical aspects in the symphony, sonatas, concertos, songs, and even dance forms. It gets rather complicated, but this is different, as we'll learn, because the fantasy isn't based on something within the theory of music, really, but rather an aesthetic. And we can trace it back to vocal music, what we call motets from the early 1500s. Evan, this might be the farthest back we've ever intentionally gone on Classical Breakdown. We've never wandered into the uh, late Renaissance or even this is almost getting into the late medieval period at this point. Oh, yes. So the question that we're going to explore is how do we get from a 16th century motet in Italy to the 20th century work that we're hearing now, a fantasy for clarinet and piano by Sarah Feigen from 1996. So let's start, Evan, with the Harvard Dictionary of Music definition of fantasy. Product of the imagination, an ingenious and imaginative instrumental composition, often characterized by distortion, exaggeration, and elusiveness, resulting from its departure from current stylistic and structural norms. I love this definition because of that word current in there. That seems pretty important, doesn't it? A departure from the current styles and norms. What might be a fantasy today might not be recognized as one 300 years ago, vice versa. It seems like an element of what the music isn't, a current style or form, is what makes it a fantasy. Yeah, and I think the word departure is also very important in that in that phrase. Yes. Outside of uh, the Harvard Dictionary, I describe fantasy as something that feels, sounds improvisatory. There's something extra in the music. There's an elusiveness, maybe something self-indulgent, exaggerated. Basically, a lot of imagination, as even the non-musical Webster definition describes the word. I think another way to bring this to um, everyone's minds is think about the last century and the word rhapsody or rhapsodic. I think a lot of those elements cross over with the, the fantasy. Right. And one of the things we'll encounter as we explore the whole question of fantasy is deciding what's a fantasy and what's not, and things that maybe aren't called a fantasy could still be regarded as one. These are all uh, some of the elements of the things we'll be exploring. And we'll probably say the word fantasy in different ways because we have fantasy, uh, fantasia, fantasia. There's different languages of just the word itself. Exactly. Okay. So, Evan, we are In our time machine, we're off for early 1500s Italy. It's the middle of the Renaissance period, and it's so far back, the pizza is unrecognizable. They don't even have tomato or cheese on it at this point. So, what music might we hear when we arrive? A motet. beautiful music that really evokes an older time and a motet really it's like a concerto or symphony in that it's a type of work motets are short sacred works for voices coming from the renaissance period we're thinking around 1400 to uh, 1600 right we hear them in liturgical forms uh they're part of uh, worship services the word motet comes uh, you know the french word m-o-t mo or mot, we have the word bon mot in English, we say that. It simply means word. Motet is a thing that is a setting of words. Yes. What happened was lute players, this predecessor to uh, the guitar that we know today, sought to imitate this style of the motet, this um, kind of free, open sound. And it really it gave us the first fantasies. Louis de Milan, who was born in 1500, lived to 1561, wrote a fantasia, really one of the, the first ones. And it doesn't sound like, I think, a fantasy we would expect today, does it? 
Well, and this is an important innovator in the practice of the playing of plucked instruments. Uh, Luis de Milan was a maestro of the vihuela, which is a Spanish Iberian instrument, which looks sort of like a small guitar tuned more like a lute. And uh, this, like you said, John, this this style of playing, this very fantastical manner, which is in some ways derived from the motet style of writing, but also kind of goes beyond it in some ways. Yes. And just speaking of the writing, music notation is in transition, I think, still at this point. It is not what we expect today. Even in Bach, there was not all the kind of information and uh, music that we see on our uh, on our pages today. One thing you can really listen for, uh, a characteristic of the motet, is, you know, you hear them singing and they're often twisting and turning around um, a couple of notes. And they're doing it on the same syllable. We call that a melisma. And I think you can listen for that same aspect in the lute or in the organ, because the organ was also an instrument used for these um, fantasies or fantasias. So Louis de Milan, along with another composer, Francesco uh, da Milano, they were the first ones really to write fantasies. This is nearly 500 years ago, and for more context... These composers, musicians, were born nearly 200 years before Johann Sebastian Bach. That is quite a perspective, I think. Right. So this is a tradition that's going way back. Mm -hmm. Later in the 16th century, organist and composer Jan Sveilink, a composer I think I've never really heard in the United States, but still popular in, in parts of Europe, he was writing fantasies for himself at the organ, and they have this still improvisatory feeling like we have something sustaining in the left hand, and then the other hand is kind of meandering around, maybe playing those melismas we just described, or um, ornaments and trills. Basically, it's like one thought finishes, and then it goes to another. It feels very open. Well, we're in the 16th century and getting into the 17th century. I think the word fantasy is perhaps more commonly being used to describe something that can't be described some other way. So very often a work that's called a fantasy has this very elaborate style. There's a lot of virtuosic writing for the instrument. But again, if the form of the piece is not a form that can be described any other way, fantasy is often a good term. Mm. So at this point, some music is still written out... um not fully like we expect today, as we already mentioned. And some of it is unmeasured, meaning that while the notes and rhythms are written on the page, how exactly they're played together or stretched out um, in that rhythm is determined by the musician. Think of it like a 12-inch ruler that has no markings on it. You know the entire thing is one foot. You know it contains 12 inches, but where exactly those inches start, begin, or differ, maybe that can be up to you. Yeah, the idea that you should adhere very strictly to what's written on the page is a much later concept. So, you know, in the 19th and 20th centuries, we get into that attitude. You really don't see it in the uh, 1700s or before. And remember, we don't even have cheese on our pizza yet at this point. Exactly. So far, the fantasies that we've heard, they fall into the first category as described in that Harvard Music Dictionary definition. And it's described as the fantasy of quasi-improvisation. This is between 1500 and 1600, and it's basically everything we just described. This improvisatory element is part of being a musician and part of playing the music as well. So now we start to move into the 1600s with what Harvard describes as the fantasy of learned polyphony. This is music that's more written out and cohesive, isn't it? Yeah, we were mentioning Svelink earlier, and one of the works that I think of with this title, Fantasy, is the Fantasia Chromatica, which is a keyboard work that's about uh, typical performances, maybe just under 10 minutes. And it begins with uh, what, what sounds like a fugue. Now, I think I hear the word fugue, I think like that is one of the strictest forms in in music yeah i mean it's almost this very academic kind of a thing so why is this what is it about this it's a fantasy well you know the the maybe that's a description of the harmonic adventurousness of the piece maybe it's a description of very chromatic writing maybe the form of the whole piece doesn't really have any other way of being described so this is again another example of how the word fantasy can really have a a great breadth of meaning yes 
polyphony or polyphonic music, that is a lot to describe. I think for our purposes, we're just thinking of polyphony as how we make melodic lines sounding at the same time sound cohesive. So I, I, maybe this there is that crossover element with the fugue, Evan, in that what you just described sort of matches some of the motets and that there's multiple lines happening at the same time. Less strict, I think, of course, than a fugue, but um, I guess it, it comes from that in some way, at least. Yeah, an imitative counterpoint is a component of European music throughout the centuries and different styles and so forth. And when we're talking about fantasy, you know, there's no reason why imitative counterpoint, even fairly strict imitative counterpoint, even fugal writing can't be a component of fantasy. Fantasy, the fantasia, the fantasia, it spreads in Europe. Actually, it starts to leave Italy in the 1600s. After 1620, there's not really anything from um, fantasy in Italy. But it spreads, to, especially with organists, to places like um, uh, what we call Germany and also uh, France. Charles Raquette wrote a, a fantastic um, fantasy for the organ. So as things start to shift in the Baroque period, we can look to a composer like Johann Sebastian Bach with, I think, a great example of what the fantasy can result in, Evan, because everything that we've been describing leaves so much up to the musician, to the, um, to the player, to determine for themselves. So if we take a chromatic fantasy by Bach and we play just the opening statement here, I'm going to play the opening statement from three different musicians. And that's what I love about this kind of music, Evan. You get so many different interpretations. I don't hear that so much with music from the 19th and 20th centuries. And if you're playing something that's in a stricter form, like a piano sonata and, you know, like the minuet of a, a third movement of a piano sonata, there's a pretty strict form. There's a particular tempo that you're supposed to play a minuet at. You have some leeway, but you're, you're kind of bound by a certain set of expectations. With a fantasy type of writing, there's almost no wrong way to do it. And that's one of the things that's exciting and also a bit scary for a performer about deciding how to interpret what's written on the page. Oh, that's a good way to put it. And the people we just heard were Jeremy Dank, Glenn Gould, and then some may recognize Jacob Pastorius, the, uh, the bassist there at the end. So many different ways that you can play this. And after this, it seems like there's a little bit of a lull in fantasy works between Bach and between Beethoven. I think it's understandable given the large aesthetic developments that happen in music in the 18th century as we start to um, move away from the Baroque period, but we still have a lot of great examples, and we'll get into those right after this. So the music we heard by Bach just a moment ago, that was from around 1710 to 1720. Moving on, we can see that sometimes a fantasy is actually a movement within a larger work, the second movement to Weber's clarinet quintet is a fantasy, and that's also the same work for where we get our theme for this podcast. And I think that's that's interesting. I wonder, Evan, if that is also at play with the departure of styles or, 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 um, or norms or forms when you have this piece and then you add something in the middle that's fantasy. I imagine you can have a lot of liberty there, almost no wrong way to play it compared to what's happening around it, which is much more strict maybe. And this is an interesting question about, especially if we're talking about the late 18th and early 19th centuries, a composer like Weber, you just mentioned, and the whole question of the musical aesthetic in Europe in this time. We get to the end of the 18th century and these very strict forms really become the norm. Think about the development of the symphony, for example, and there's you know a very particular way that these pieces get uh, get structured. So within that context, composers like Mozart and Haydn and uh, you mentioned Weber later, a little bit later on, are, are still writing fantasies occasionally. And what are they doing that's different 
in a work that's entitled fantasy, well, one thing they're doing is maybe they're taking those strict forms and kind of disregarding them. Some of it has to do with uh, some of the harmonic language you find in some of these pieces as we get into some of these other things we're going to talk about. They may be a little bit more harmonically adventurous if it's called a fantasy. Yes. Mozart wrote a uh, fantastic one, the K-397. It was actually published after his death. Haydn's 1789 Fantasia also has the subtitle Capriccio. And I think we see that a lot as um, a substitute as well for Fantasia, a language thing. Sometimes Capriccio and and Fantasy, they're kind of meaning the same thing, aren't they? Yeah, and this particular piece by Haydn is an interesting one. He takes an old folk song, The Farmer's Wife Has Lost Her Cat, is the English translation of the title of the folk song. And, you know, in a lot of Haydn works, uh, we see a theme in variations kind of structure. A very famous one would be the slow movement of the surprise symphony. Very strict theme and variations. Here in this this Capriccio, the farmer's wife lost her cat, he takes his folk tune. It's kind of like a theme and variations, but much more free form, both in terms of the structure of the piece, but also if you look at the harmonic directions this piece goes in. It starts and ends in C major, but he goes into just, I wouldn't say every key on the keyboard, but really wanders around quite a bit harmonically in a way that you would not find very often in one of his symphonies, for example. Well, when you lose your pet, I mean, you look under any any cushion, any couch, <laughs> anywhere you can look. Is my cat hiding in an A major chord? Is he hiding in a B flat major chord? Where's my cat? You know, it just kind of wanders around in this crazy and, and fun way. And of course, Haydn's humor uh, really shines in that piece. And talk about a missed opportunity for a much better subtitle instead of Capriccio, I'd be much more interested if it said The Farmer's Wife Lost Her Cat. That brings us to the 19th century, which also means on a timeline that these composers are closer to us than the ones that started this whole fantasy thing off, the Louis de Milan. So now that the fantasy is more developed, composers start to take it in all kinds of um, directions, I think as we see with a lot of things in the 19th century, and the Harvard Dictionary describes this time as simply the Fantasia after the 18th century. A great one, Evan, that we mentioned a little bit in a much earlier episode was Beethoven's Choral Fantasy, and that's because this has a very interesting tune that makes an appearance here that we also know, of course, in Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 9. But this one seems like it was a little bit closer to the original idea of a fantasy because he does a lot of improvisation in the beginning. Beethoven that is actually at the premiere. He didn't actually write any of the music down for the opening until after he played it at a premiere. This piece gives us a real great insight into Beethoven as a performer. We know from contemporary accounts that Beethoven was a very skilled improviser. He really would move audiences. He would sit down at the piano and he would just play whatever came to his mind. And of course, he was such a genius. We know that within certain forms, like a sonata form, for example, he was able to do extraordinary things. But what the choral fantasy shows us is in a more freeform style, he's also able to carry us on this incredible journey. So the opening piano solo of the choral fantasia is this, you know, what's the structure of it? It just kind of wanders around and yet it's this very compelling journey that we go on musically and the themes that he introduces there then become part of the piece as a whole when the orchestra comes in and then the choir comes in with this this hymn-like tune which as you said John is very similar to the very famous Ode to Joy theme of the Ninth Symphony and Beethoven is this composer I think perhaps more than any of the other romantic composers is taking the inherited forms the very strict forms of classicism of the late 18th century not departing from them not throwing them out altogether but really stretching them and when you have Beethoven writing a piece called the fantasy he's really stretching those things beyond the limits and going into a realm of imagination that's hard to describe any other way other than to say it's a fantasy And as people will notice, we aren't talking about fantasies for solo instruments like piano or organ so much after this point, some. But now we have a soloist, often accompanied by piano or with with an orchestra. This 
also means that we're improvising a little bit less. Yes, Beethoven was able to do that in his own way with that choral fantasy, but for everyone else, as time moves on, improvising is less something that is um, required as being a musician, and it's more about this interpretation. And so you see different interpretations of music, but not so much um, improvising. Some people still do, and they're, um, they're geniuses too. But we can look at another one. This is from 1830, Fanny Mendelssohn's Fantasy in G minor for cello and piano. For me, Evan, this is so emblematic of the Romantic period. I mean, it sounds like this belongs in the soundtrack to a drama. There is something really fantastical about this one. Another one would be Schumann's Fantasy Stuka. He wrote a couple of these, right? One for piano and um, my personal favorite, one for clarinet and piano. I love to play the Opus 73, originally for um, clarinet. It's also played by cello, tuba, oboe, all kinds of instruments. Every note has some kind of emotional weight, some kind of direction. You don't even have time to really think when you're playing this. You are just solely committed and fully within the music. But we also see him writing one for the solo piano, right? Right, the Fadazi Stücke Opus 12, uh, Robert Schumann, which is a, a kind of a similar piece to the Carnival, the Opus 9. It's a suite of short piano pieces, and you have these two characters in Schumann's imagination, Florestan and Eusebius, and they represent different aspects of his personality. There's often kind of a storyline. Sometimes we don't always know what the storyline is. Schumann, very sort of autobiographical composer, very poetic in his imagination. Uh, you look at the Davids, Bunde, Tenza, and these other pieces where he's kind of writing about himself and his, his, uh, his marriage and his friends and uh, their sort of artistic and creative struggles and, and triumphs and so forth. And there's this whole little drama going on. So we're not looking at uh, a suite of dance pieces like you'd see in the 18th century with these strict forms like the Allemande and the Courant and the Minuet. Mm -hmm. You're seeing instead these flights of imagination and these little piano pieces these short piano pieces or uh, other works, uh, works for other instruments where there's more of a focus on storytelling and conveying emotion outside of the bounds of a strict musical structure. A famous example that a lot of people love, and it's still played a lot um, in concert and on the radio, that is the Carmen Fantasy by uh, Sarasate, one of the more popular ones for soloist and orchestra. I think in part that's because the um, imaginative color, energy, and harmony of Carmen works in this um, uh, works in this format, but also because he's using all these hit melodies and they can be quite different from each other. So you have that contrast, that current departure from uh, the form and style. And we start to see this as something included as fantasy. Um, what we might call a medley or, or a compilation of something today. Right. So these were tunes that people would have known. This is the, late, the uh, early 1880s. Carmen came out in uh, 1875, uh, a flop at first, but then it became very popular. And these tunes were well known to audiences. What Sarasate does, what a lot of composers writing in this particular fantasy genre at the end of the 19th century are doing, taking familiar tunes and really, you might say, jamming with them, you know, really doing these crazy riffs. So rather than just playing the vocal line, you know, you, you could just sit there with the violin and go, da 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 which is, you know, a wonderful thing. But he really creates that, uh, that quasi-improvisational style, but it's all very strictly written out. So we're creating kind of, it's almost like this magic trick where we're creating the illusion of improvising when in fact it's very carefully thought out, carefully planned out, and any violinist will tell you hours of practice are needed for this very virtuosic writing for the instrument. Sarasate was a great showman, uh, quite a skilled composer, an amazing violinist by all accounts, and uh, was certainly not ashamed to write music for himself to play that would really show off his ability. And so to take these familiar tunes and reinterpret them through this lens of this quasi-improvisational style, these flights of fancy, 
uh, with a really virtuosic solo part is becomes a very popular genre at this point. Uh, Franz Liszt also wrote a number of these kinds of pieces for solo piano. Uh, he didn't often use the word fantasy to describe them. He often called them reminiscences, uh, reminiscences. Uh, reminiscences of Don Juan is one of the most famous ones where he takes tunes from Mozart's Don Giovanni. And again, he doesn't just sort of transcribe them for keyboard. He makes it into this really exciting voyage through which we we hear the familiar tunes from Mozart, but they are reinterpreted in a very Listian way, and it becomes a tribute to Mozart, but also very much in the voice of Franz Liszt. And with so much of that breakdown of um, form, even in the 19th century, there's works that don't have the word fantasy in them, maybe just like, you know, reminiscence or, or whatever, but they still fit the, the not the definition so much, but they still fit the style. Um, sometimes it feels like the fantasy itself was a vehicle to get the symphonic poem underway, even at this time. Right. And, you know, what's the difference between a fantasy and a rhapsody? What's the difference between a symphonic poem and a concert overture? I mean, the title is often... You know, we can get hung up on why the composer used this term or that term to describe a piece. Yes. And we especially see that going into the 20th century, which is where we're going now, the fantasy declines in popularity. But one businessman and also amateur violinist in England, Walter Wilson Cobbett, actually tried to revive it, creating a, a competition for composing fantasies. And it actually led to... Um, fantasies by big composers like John Ireland, Frank Bridge, and also Benjamin Britten a few years later in 1932. Another composer from the 20th century, Rafe von Williams, wrote a couple of fantasies, famously the Fantasia on a Theme of, uh, by Thomas Tallis, and more famously, the, the Fantasia on Green Sleeves, which I think we enjoyed on repeat almost as much as the um, Pachelbel Canon, didn't we? Well, and they're both great pieces, very popular. And again, why are they called fantasies? Well, I'm not sure what other term to use. What's the form? It's not a uh, sonata form. It's not uh, a minuet. You know, what's the form? It's just sort of, it's a, it's a marvelous, imaginative meandering around, grounded in these very old English tunes. Mm -hmm. This is a great example, I think, of... Uh, a fantasy and also a combination of what we've talked about earlier. This is Amy Beach's Opus 87, Fantasia Fugata. I'm mean, talking about combining, like you said before, it's one of the strictest forms, fugue, with this thing that has no form, the, the fantasy. So this is a great work. In the middle, there is that fugue. Um, if you haven't heard this one, I recommend it. It's, it's dramatic and... This is definitely something that would get a huge applause um, as an encore at the end of a concert or something like that. Amy Beach, certainly a great composer who, among other things, had a great knowledge of the forms of classicism and how romantic composers had reinterpreted those forms. So she was able to use her vast imagination to create this marvelous piece. Now, I think if you say the word Fantasia to just the most people in the general population, I think on average, most would think of Disney's Fantasia, the, the cartoon and the orchestra and um, the music from all of the different composers. I think this still works as a Fantasia, Evan, in its own way. One, it's imaginative. It's, it departs from current styles and norms, I think, in both music and in film. I don't think there was anything quite like this before or even really since. Yeah, it really kind of stands alone in its own way. I, I, I admit I have mixed feelings about the film. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot about it that's quite imaginative, and there are things about it that I, for, they're a little hard for me to take. The, my favorite part of that, of uh, Disney's Fantasia, is the opening section where the we hear mm -hmm. the orchestra playing a Stokowski transcription of the Bach Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Yeah. And unlike the other scenes in the movie where you have characters in a story, you have, you know, animals dancing around or you have Mickey Mouse as the sorcerer's apprentice or whatever, in that very first section there's just this sort of disembodied splashes of color you see some mm -hmm. string violin bows sort of wafting disembodied in space and uh to me that's uh, the most fantastical of the fantasia elements of that film and that's my favorite part of the movie <laughs> 
that brings us to our most recent example, in time that is, from 1996, that fantasy for clarinet and piano by Sarah Feigen that we mentioned at the top of the podcast. This is a shorter one. It's just under five minutes, but it takes you on such a journey, and it's so evocative. And I just want to maybe push people for a moment here and that some of these works are, are very short, but that doesn't mean they're not as thought out or not as hard or to play or to, to compose. This is not a symphony. Sometimes you listen to a symphony by a composer and five minutes goes by and you're not sure if anything's even happening for some of these symphonies that are like an hour and a half long. Evan, I've been playing a lot of Game Boy, the original Game Boy recently with that terrible tiny green screen. And when you play it, there's such a, a world inside those little one and a half inch screen. There's so much happening and you zoom out and it's like, wow, all that's happening right there. I think it's the same for the um, fantasy. It may be short, but there is such a world and there's so much happening within that small space. And it's the sense, I, I think the Game Boy metaphor is a, is a valid one, John, in that with a fantasy, we're dealing with a world of play. We're dealing with a world of imagination. We're dealing with a world maybe of the unexpected where we're confronted with a, a, a set of tasks. We're listening to where the music is going. We don't know what's going to happen. And part of what makes the uh, a fantasy work exciting and beguiling is that sense of the unexpected, the sense of adventure, the sense of possibility. Yes. And while we don't have, I have not really found much uh, fantasy, fantasia music composed in the last uh, 20 or so years, in part that's because, well, we have our own descriptive titles for these works. Fantasy just isn't a title that I think works for maybe the average listener. They um, they see it and they're not sure exactly what it is. And we have the language now and the ability to really describe something in just a few words in a piece of music that may have been called a fantasy on something else 200 years earlier. Well, we, be, we end where we began, which is that Harvard Music Dictionary definition of a departure from current forms. Well, what are the current forms of 2023? Uh, I'm not sure how I would describe that. Yeah. So how do you make a fantasy on those current forms when maybe current forms are, maybe the current form is formlessness? Yes. This was a fantastic 500-year journey that we just took, and it makes me wonder, what are we doing right now that may be the, the seed of something 500 years into the future? We'll have to see, I guess. So now it's time to get to your reviews from Apple Podcasts. Evan, what do we have? We've got a five-star review from, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, U-S-A-F-X-E-N-A, Usaf Zena, maybe? I'm that's exactly sure how, you... how I would say it. All right. That's, that's the username on Apple Podcasts who gave us a review on March 10th. Five-star review. Unique and informative was the exclamation that begins it. And the person continues, I'm a long-term listener to WETA and an amateur musician in the D.C. area. The episode on the bassoon caught my attention, my instrument, and that was the first episode I listened to. I've since listened to them all and look forward to each new release. I've played many of the pieces you've discussed, and it is fun to learn more about the music and the composer who wrote it. This podcast is unlike any other that I'm aware of. So interesting and informative. Keep it coming. Well, thank you so much, Yusef Zina, or however you might pronounce your very creative uh, username on Apple Podcasts. We will keep them coming. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown, your guide to classical music. For more information on this episode, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. You can send me comments and episode ideas to classicalbreakdown at weta.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, leave a review in your podcast app. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from WETA Classical.